طيب الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of the heavens and the earth the way he deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I bear witness <coughs> like you bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah he is alone with no partners and no rivals and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger as you should all know Islam is a wonderful thing I'm serious I know in uh, 2020 uh, people look for uh, entertainment they look for what's hip and cool and modern and they often don't find that in religion in fact they don't find that in religion especially for those who are outsiders it is very difficult for them to look within into a religion and find it to be relevant but that's fine we shouldn't be upset we shouldn't be upset at these facts we should embrace them because this is an opportunity for us as they say to leverage on the input or the stance the people have so who can remember the title of the lecture and of course both uh, males and females or brothers and sisters can get involved who can uh, who remembers the title of the lecture or some of you just came here hoping that we were gonna play a football game no one no one knows the title of the lecture are you just worried about people entering don't worry they'll keep coming inshallah anyone in the back no one knows the title of the lecture I can just pack and leave you're breaking my heart you're hurting my feelings yes sir I remember you from back in the day somebody has to give me an answer striking the balance can anyone guess what that means what does that mean striking the balance uh, look we have two ways of doing this right either someone volunteers or I'm going to start picking people out it's gonna to be tough when I when I tell you 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 have to answer and now you have to come up with something so whoever has an answer you should save everybody else by giving me something what do you think the topic is striking the balance what does that mean yes all the way in the back striking the balance between modern world and Islam so therefore Islam and the modern world don't go together ouch all right it's cool it's a good approach good thought anybody else nobody else yes sir the balance between this world and the hereafter all right we're getting there the balance between this world and the hereafter how does that work 75 25 60 40 50 50 90 10 100 0 what's the what do you think the split it should be a split do we have an, anything particular 66 Point sixty-six versus thirty-three point thirty-three. What's the split of the balance between the dunya and the akhirah? A lot of people get confused. The basic questions, like, wait a second, <laughs> what am I supposed to say now? Um, Fifty-fifty? No, that sounds that sounds horrible. Nope. Okay, good. We have two answers, two valid answers. We need a third one before we continue. Otherwise, we'll be here till Fajr, inshallah. A third answer, striking the balance. Waalaikum salam. What is a balance like an animal and you strike it, starts running? A horse? Zareer, you wanna. <laughs> we'll let Zareer, even though he's not a teenager, but we'll let him slide. Father Zareer. Between the dunya and the deen? Uh huh. Oh, and we, okay, we have, we have between the dunya and the deen, I like that. And you, sir? So it's like the things of 
pushing you to one thing and then you, it's like lots of other things as well. Okay, there's something pushing you and there's a lot, lots of other stuff as well. Okay, it's a little vague, but I, I think I can feel what you're saying. Oh, we, oh, now we have more answers. When I said I needed one more, now, mashallah, the volunteers. Tfaddal. Aywa. This is exactly what I'm not looking for. So there are two paths. The good one and the bad one, you go in the middle. So you end up where? <laughs> where do you end up? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly, Sheikh. There's a good path and there's a bad path. You go 50. Uh, you know, don't be a 100% good Muslim. Don't be a 100% bad Muslim. Yani, one day you're good, one day you're bad. Nope. Nope. Nice try though. I appreciate the feedback. Anyway, the sisters are quiet. No one can see you all the way in the back. Speak. I need one more answer from the sisters and then I'll start. I know the phones are supposed to be on silent mode, not humans. One more sister with one more answer, come on. Yes. All right, good. All right, here it is. Amazingly, amazingly, the answer or striking the balance applies to everything. Every single thing in this life, every single thing in this life. As a Muslim, you're supposed to go in between, except the good Muslim, bad Muslim one. Minus that exception, you are supposed to be always on a moderate path. And the objective of this lecture, inshallah, is to give you the various applications or layers or dimensions to which this applies. So that it is practical and not theoretical. You know the difference between practical and theoretical? Theoretical is when someone tells you a lot of stories and a lot of theories, but then when you get out of the door, it's like, okay, so now what? I, ca I can't apply anything in my everyday life. Practical is when you learn something that you can implement while you're sitting here. And then tonight, and then tomorrow morning, and then to, you know, until, until you meet Allah. So we're going to discuss the practical aspects of the moderation. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that position. Now I have a, a tip for you, all right? And today I was attending a training at Samsung. Most of you know I work for Samsung. Some of you do, some of you don't. And the, ironically, the training was about how to conduct yourself as a speaker and then how to conduct yourself as an audience. Are you guys with me? No, you're not. You are at the door. This is the idea of multitasking. How many of you can multitask? Uh, wh what is your concept of multitasking? Uh, all right. Using four devices at once. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, like four phones? All right. So we gave similar answers, right? The, the trainer, we were, I was of the opinion that you can multitask. And he was of the opinion that there's no such thing as multitasking. And I was offended. Like, how could you say, like, I multitask all the time. I told him I, I drive and eat a sandwich and speak on the phone at the same time. And I used to, I've done this all my life. I'm, I'm eating a sandwich and driving simultaneously and someone calls me, I can have a conversation. So I said, I'm, I'm a multitasker. And he said, yeah, that's, that's not really multitasking because when you're driving, guys, be careful, there's a camera there. So much for that. He's like, there's a camera, let me stand right there. Um, so he said, no, that's not really multitasking. That's like driving is second nature. The reality of multitasking, or when let's say I'm on the phone, all right? Let's say I'm on the phone and someone's speaking to me. Now you think that you're able to focus on both. If you're reading something and listening to someone, wh whichever one gets more concentration, the other one will what? will miss out on it. 
So true, to some degree, you're doing two things at the same time, but you're unable to give them an equal amount of concentration. Your body can only, your mind can only focus on one more than the other. So now I'm speaking. Every time this door opens and someone walks in, honestly, 85% of you have no idea what I'm saying. They know there's a guy wearing a hoodie, uh, sitting there talking to the mic and you're focusing on the guy, what he's wearing, what you've met him before, you've been with him to school. By the time you pick up on where I left off, you will only get 10% of the lecture. And as I'm saying it, you're doing it right now. For you to truly concentrate, you're going to have to ignore, and not just because of me, it, it could be anybody giving you a talk. You have to learn, stop clicking the pen please. You have to learn how to focus on that one topic for now until we have a conversation or we take a break or something happens that allows you to multitask. Otherwise, you can all, only monotask. So my humble advice to you is, in spite of the commotion that's happening, people going in, people going out, it's no big deal. Learn just like khutbat al-Jum'ah. Do you brothers and sisters know that, or for the brothers uh, specifically, that on Jum'ah, if you sit there and play with your toe, while the Imam has given the khutbah, you will have no reward for this khutbah? Zero. If you start twirling with your hair, playing with your nails, anything, and people do all types of stuff. See, people clean their whole body. During the khutbah al-Jum'ah, if he has a pimple, he pops it. If he has a dirt under his nail, he cleans it. Yeah, cracking every toe, every finger, one after the other, his back, his neck. Khalas ya baba. And you just attending Jum'ah, you're getting zero reward. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't do this, they had pebbles. You know, they're sitting on the ground, they're pebbles. So the person would play with the pebble. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ حَصْ مَنْ مَسَّ الْحَصَى فَقَدْ لَغَى وَمَنْ لَغَى لَا جُمْعَةَ لَهُ Whoever just plays with the pebbles has committed an idle act, and whoever commits an idle act has no Jum'ah. You will have no reward for Jum'ah. So if you really want to learn how to concentrate, Jum'ah is the school. It's 25-30 minutes of someone talking to you, and your job, of course you can scratch, just so you won't think you're going to be playing some freezing game. You can scratch or you can do what is necessary, but it is a, it's a learning lesson for you to be able to pay, pay attention continuously for some 25-30 minutes, which your brain is able to do without being distracted by the people entering and leaving. And that's why if you come on Friday and you start walking over people, you've committed a major sin. Because you are actually distracting the people that are trying to pay attention to the khatib by you becoming, uh, you know, annoying and walking through everyone and trying to squeeze people and tell them to move so you can sit down in a place where you don't really belong. You came late, the tax of coming late is sitting in the back with the old people. You get me? So that's just a quickie. Please try to focus on the talk or on the talker irrespective of who it is so that you can have a, a, a source of benefit inshallah ta'ala. Anyways, so we said that we're going to discuss all of the matters that have to do with uh, balancing your life in every respect and how Islam is actually the only way, the only, the only way you can lead a truly successful life while you are on this earth and then when you're buried and then when you're resurrected. And then when it's all said and done, when there's Jannah and Jahannam. No other religion, no other ideology, no other philosophy, no other teacher, instructor, whatever you want to call it, is able to offer people this type of solution. Whatever the people offer is only to fix certain issues today. They're not long term and they will certainly not carry on to the life to come. What's the only solution? Islam. So I want to address the idea that Islam is not disconnected from the modern world. Islam actually dictates the modern world. We should be the example for the rest of mankind and not the other way around. We set the standards we don't follow. We are the leaders, we ought to be followed. Our problem is that we have an inferiority complex. Because we don't believe in ourselves enough, we find ourselves having to run after other people when it should be the other way around. We should be laying down the foundations for mankind to know how to live life properly without going to extremes. Because we have extremes and extremists everywhere we go. Anyways, 
Who gave us this privilege? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does anyone know which ayah is always quoted when we speak about Islam and or Muslims being people that are moderate on a middle path? I know a couple of you have the answer. What ayah is cited to support this position? Inna or wa وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Such, Allah says, such, we have made you a middle path nation. A moderate nation. So the first principle that I want you to focus on is that this concept of moderation and striking the balance is divinely revealed. It is not invented by some human being. Not some philosopher who became famous and then had followers like Buddha. Buddha didn't claim to be a god or anything of the sort. He's just a dude. And then people made him into what, you know, he's considered as today. But he was just a philo someone who was go going by some sort of philosophy in life. If, if the concept that the humans follow is man-made, then what's the issue with it? Is it fallible or infallible? It's fallible. No, infallible meaning there's no issues in it. If a human invented it, then it's subject to what? Difference of opinion. Like why, why is your opinion better than mine? It's subjective. You feel this way, I feel this way, he feels this way. But when it comes from Allah, is it, is it open to discussion? Not really. You can disagree. But if you disagree now, you're going to have to also express your disagreement when you stand before Allah. Always remember that. Anytime you have an issue with some Islamic teaching that is authentic, and you feel like some macho man about it, remember that if you express your disapproval now, be man enough or woman enough to also do so on Yawm Al-Qiyamah before Allah. Tell him on that day that you had a problem with the religion. I'm sure anyone with a iota of intellect will say, no, thank you so much. Not interested. Because that's not some king or some president. That's the creator of the heavens and the earth who controls everything. You don't want any issues over there. Are we clear? All right, so it is divinely revealed. Now, whenever it comes to extremism, whenever it comes to extremism, people are always on two extremes. The middle path is actually always between two extremes. Extremes in a sense that you're either extremely going overboard or you are extremely... You are going overboard or you're extremely what? Negligent, right? Ifrat and tafrit is what they call them in Arabic. Going overdoing things or underdoing them. Doing too much or not doing enough. Moderation is that you are neither nor. Okay, how does that apply in our daily life? Who can give me an example where someone goes to extreme in religious matters? Yes? Uh, it's when they believe that all other religions are bad or they discriminate other religions. Who? Like, when Muslims believe other religions are bad? Like when, like when they believe so much in that this is right, that they don't believe that there's anything else. Is there anything else? I'm glad you said that. that can you explain to me? That what, what do you mean by something else? Let's say, let's put them out there. Christianity, Judaism... Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, then we can go to a bunch of other isms, but let's stick to the main ones. So if, if a person is extreme, thereby believing only Islam is good and the others are bad. Is that what you're saying? No, I mean like, uh, like discriminating between the other religions. Okay, what, what, what is this supposed to be? Equality between the religions? Because discrimination is the lack of equality or equity. Do you want to put them all on the same level? When they disrespect other people for their beliefs. As in mocking them? Yes. In which context? Maybe you want to speak about violence? I'm hoping you mean that, you know, Muslims who say, you don't agree with us, therefore, you know, you gotta go. 
and then they go and you know blow up something or bomb something or they take physical action uh, into uh, other people who just don't share their faith. Is that what you mean? I hope so. Yes. Very good. Can you do you know? Can we define khawarij? Uh, I don't know the definition. I'll help you. I know they they would deem that if someone did a minor sin. Very good. The khawarij fundamentally were the first denomination to actually leave mainstream Islam, and that started at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, their main thing is that they they had two issues or many issues, but their main two issues was one. They would say, if you committed a major sin, khalas, you're not a Muslim anymore. And we have many modern sects today that actually follow the same ideology. Even though they're not really from the khawarij in the full sense, but they share that concept with the khawarij. Meaning if you don't adhere to the way they pray or the, what they believe, you automatically exit Islam. And also their concept was that they always wanted to go against the rulers which many people don't understand that Islam gave us very particular guidelines about how to deal with the people in charge. Whichever country that has a Muslim ruler, we have very a strict code of conduct with those individuals. And the Khawarij are, are fanatics who love to overthrow governments and revolt and protest and then the end result is nothing but dead people and casualties and corruption among the, the world and, and the first one who came up with this idea is the same person who told the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Ya Muhammad I'dil He said, Oh Muhammad be just He didn't think the Prophet Muhammad was just And so if they had a problem with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, By default they're gonna have a problem with anybody who's gonna be lesser than him and we are all lesser than him Good The Khawarij, okay that's one extreme What's the opposite extreme? Uh, the opposite extreme of a person who's in La La Land. He thinks he's a Muslim, but he doesn't do anything that, uh, that like, uh, they're supposed to do, like the five pillars. Right. So, Islam is just a banner. It's a title, it's an... It's a law, I call him a long-distance Muslim. Who's still traveling, but he hasn't made it to the destination. So Islam is slogan, it's a nice slogan, maybe he has some loyalty to it because of his family, because of his culture, because of his country. But in reality, this person doesn't pray at all. Uh, he may or may not fast Ramadan uh, and he is completely disconnected from the religion tooth and nail. This is another extreme. So what is it supposed to mean? Is, does that mean that we're supposed to be 50-50 about it? Just practice some Islam, commit some sins and then we're... In between? No. Can you become a perfect Muslim? Can anyone become a perfect Muslim? Is anyone here sinless? Doesn't commit sins? That person, that human being doesn't exist. That human being doesn't exist. I will give you the formula later on inshallah of how to uh, correlate and harmonize between adhering to Islam, practicing Islam fully and dealing with our human errors and human shortcomings. But that will come later, inshallah. Uh, Wahab ibn Murabbih said, Verily everything has two ends, everything has two ends and a middle. If you hold one of the ends, the other will be screwed. You, you can't keep the balance. So the only way you can, if you have a stick, the only way you can technically balance it properly is if you hold it, from the middle. Once you hold one side, then the other side is vulnerable to falling, to going up, for up, going up or going down. You can't really have that ultimate control. He said, the two ends will be balanced. You must seek the middle ground in all things. You must seek the middle ground in all things. Now, uh, Satan, uh, the devil and his children, their objective in life their non-stop continuous effort is to make you go to one of the two extremes. If he sees that you're not open to ignoring Islam, or he knows that you have a strong enough Iman for you to practice Islam, where does he try to take you now? To the other extreme. Where you become strict 
in areas that the Islam didn't make strict and you make haram what Allah made halal. A lot of people take this matter lightly and I was having a discussion with a brother last night about this very topic. You have to understand when we say, look, Akhi, this thing is makruh. Maybe it's disliked. So for me to be on the safe side, I should leave it alone altogether. While this is true, you have to also be careful that you don't wind up making haram what Allah made halal. And Allah warned us in the Quran that this is among the major crimes. يُحَرِّمُونَ ma أَحَلَّ Allah. They make unlawful what Allah made lawful. And you meet a lot of brothers who come and say, brother, this is haram. Like, calm down a little bit. What is haram about it? That, are you aware of the evidence? Are you aware of the discussion of the scholars? Do you know the, the background on a subject matter? Therefore, the most part, he does not even know the evidence. Well, I heard my uncle. You heard your uncle? But put, put your uncle on the phone. And then you speak to his uncle, he will tell you what? I heard from my uncle. And you keep to my uncle, my uncle, until you reach the uncle that is not even alive. And so how do you verify this information? Wallah, this is our culture. In our culture, this is halal and this is haram. That, what, that brother was telling me that one sister told her, you're not allowed to wear, she said to the sister, you're not allowed to wear a, a, a ring on your shahada finger. I'm like, I didn't know this was called a shahada finger. All right. It's a finger. Mashi, people usually use it to give the shahada. But that's a new title for it. Secondly, um, why is it haram to wear a ring for a female? Of course, within her maharim. Why is it haram for her to wear a, 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 a ring in her index finger? And of course, there's no evidence. That's, that's how we were taught when we were kids. That, that is not grounds for you to start telling people because you heard that you cannot do this or you cannot do that. So when a person, it, it, when the shaitan is unable to sway you from the path by making you neglect Islam, he will now try to take you in the path where you become the mufti of earth. That brother is going around telling everybody, yay and nay, do this, don't do that, with no proper knowledge, without a foundation. And Islam is supposed to be somewhere in between. If you're interested, you learn about the subject matter, you, you read the uh, statements of the scholars, you need to have the Arabic language for the most part, you can't rely on translation. It takes a lot of tools that you must possess for you to start telling, the, even convey that this is halal or haram. You should know what you're talking about. Type. Uh, does anyone know the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud? I'm only going to say Ibn Mas'ud because you're supposed to know it by the name of a Sahabi. That is related to the topic. Does anyone know who Ibn Mas'ud is? What was unique about Ibn Mas'ud? Somebody name one unique characteristic of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu arda. What do you know about Cristiano Ronaldo? No, oh, he's better than Messi. Uh, he won, I don't know, scored, I don't know how many goals in 1997. Then you tell me his biography. You say Ibn Mas'ud, say, who's Ibn Mas'ud? I've heard this name before. Is he our neighbor? La, ya Sheikh is not your neighbor. No one knows anything about Ibn Mas'ud? Zarir, yani, if you're going to give me all the answers, of course the two of you know. No one else from the sisters, no one knows Ibn Mas'ud. No one knows a hadith about him, a story about him. Ajeeb. See, there, see, this is what I'm saying. Look, look, this is a live, practical example of what I'm saying. Striking the balance does not mean that if someone said Messi or Ronaldo, you say, huh, who? And now you're a good Muslim. Oh, mashallah, tabarakallah. You don't know Ronaldo? Wallah, I don't know Ronaldo. Mashallah, great Muslim. No, it doesn't mean that. It's okay to know who he is. But when you don't know Ibn Mas'ud, then we have a problem. Do you understand me? Are you able to know both? Grab a seat. Are you able to know both? So can I ask you, in your, I don't know how old you are, 16, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever your age is, in your entire life, you've never had the opportunity to learn anything about the Sahabi? 
But you've had plenty of opportunities to play Fortnite for four or five straight hours, or PUBG, or FIFA, or Batikha, or Dajaja, or whatever that you play nowadays. No time for Sahabi. See, this is the issue. Where is the balance? We are not striking the balance. If I told you, no Ronaldo, or whoever you favor from whatever team, I don't know if you watch cricket or, or, or baseball or something else, it doesn't matter, I'm just giving an example. That's extreme. But if I say the Sahabi you don't know, that's also extreme. We are extremely negligent. Ibn Mas'ud once climbed a tree. He climbed a tree to pick up some siwak. You know the siwak? Huh? So, yes. Miswak. It's called siwak and miswak. You want miswak? Abshir. Now, you want to continue the story or what? Oh, no, I, I know something about it. Oh, alhamdulillah, go ahead. You were the companion of the Prophet and his name was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. MashaAllah, khair. So we added Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Good. Anything else? No. Good enough. At least, alhamdulillah, at least you, you recognize him. So anyways, he climbed the tree huh? in order to get the, the branch. And you know, back then they would wear uh, the izar. Izar is, is like, you know, the, what do they call it in, in the subcontinent culture? The thing that looks like a skirt. Lungi. Yeah, there you go. Lungi? Lungi? Ayo, lungi. Like from long, but it's longi, yani. Anyways. So he was wearing one of those, or what is similar to that. So the wind blew, and his legs were exposed. And he had very skinny legs. He had very skinny legs. So some of the Sahaba, you know, it's a natural reaction. It's a natural reaction. They were laughing. They were laughing at how skinny his legs were. They were too skinny for the average man. So the Prophet ﷺ in his defense, he said, are you, are you making fun? Are you joking? Are you laughing about the thinness of his legs? By the one in whose hand is my soul. They are heavier than the mountain of Uhud on the day of judgment. He, these two skinny legs, you know, mountain of Uhud is a huge mountain. Those two legs will be heavier than the mountain of Uhud on Yawm al Qiyamah. Why? Because he's Ibn Mas'ud. He was among the Qurra and among those who narrated the most from the Prophet ﷺ after. Aisha and Abu Hurairah So this is Ibn Mas'ud for you. Ibn Mas'ud narrated that the Prophet ﷺ once drew, he, they were sitting together at a sandy, sandy area. And he had a, a little twig, a stick. So he drew, he started drawing lines. Huh? Little tiny lines on the right and on the left. And he said, هَذِهِ subul." Actually, he began, I'm sorry, he, drew, he began by drawing a, a middle line, a, a line in the middle. And then he, saw, he said, هَذَا سَبِيلُ اللَّهِ مُسْتَقِيمَ This is the straight path of Allah. This is the straight path of Allah. Then he started drawing lines on the sides. He said, هَذِهِ subul. These are other paths. Pay attention. On the top of each one of these paths is a shaitan inviting you to him. On the top, of each one of these paths, there's a shaitan inviting you to him. Of course, whoever obeys him will go to Jahannam. Then he recited the ayah, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُولَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And then he recited the statement of Allah from the Quran, and very, this is my straight path, so follow it, and do not follow these other paths, otherwise it will mislead you from my straight path. This hadith is a foundational, fundamental hadith for our daily lives. That actually, and that's why I came with uh, my, my, my public page, it's called One Way to Paradise. People used to mock that. No, no, there's actually only one way to paradise. There aren't many ways to paradise. You can't just go, How, what do you feel like today? You go on your own way, I go my own way. In what sense? Of course we have our own individuality and personality. That's cool. But in terms of what Allah wants from us, there's only one way. The way of the Prophet Muhammad and the way he was understood by his companions. There's no other option. Any other option, any other option, whether back then or today, or on, the, on before the last day, will fall under the other paths.
which will have a shaitan calling to him. So you have to be very careful today. When you want to practice Islam, you need to get it from the pure source. Otherwise, there's confusion. There's other confusion out there. But if someone says, yeah, Sheikh, and I'm not a Sheikh, but it's a, in, in Saudi, in Jeddah, when I used to, they call the, the, the cat Sheikha. So everybody's a Sheikh there. Don't worry, it's not the Sheikh in the ultimate sense. Someone says, uh, then I'm confused. How do I know? Which is a straight path. We say there's no way that Allah Azza wa Jal will leave us confused. Allah did not leave us confused. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْمَحَجَّةِ الْبَيْضَةِ لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكَ I left you upon a plain, a very straightforward plain. The night is like the day. There's no, whether it's nighttime, daytime, it's always clear and, and evident. The only one who diverts from it is the one who is destroyed. If you really want to practice Islam, it's there. If you want to find zigzags, there's plenty of options. If you want to go around and maneuver and go up and down and find little loopholes and shortcuts, there's plenty, plenty. You don't have to look far. It's right there on Google. Just search. It's on YouTube. Just watch. It's in books that are authored and published. Read. You will get, you will get lost in no time. But if you want the true Islam, it's also there. But it takes a real... A real believer, a real strong Muslim to adhere to the path in spite of the uh, temptation. Tayyib. Let's talk about some of the practical aspects of Islam. Something that you can relate to. What do you think Islam has to say about money and spending? Who can give me a reference from the Quran and the Sunnah? about how you're supposed to deal with this, a daily dilemma. When it comes to money, let's say you got a thousand dirhams. You got a thousand dirhams? You don't have a thousand dirhams? You want me to give you some? How, what do you do with it? Huh? Save it la dagiga. Save it? You're hungry, you see uh, shawarma, la. Save it, ya sheikh. The whole thousand. Five. Huh? That's one opinion. Starve to death. Save the thousand dirham. Give the whole thousand for charity and khali wali. You don't need anything. Right? Okay. Spend it wisely to give a little bit of charity. A little bit of charity. Or 2%? 2.5%. <laughs> That's zakah, ya sheikh. Tamam. Fair enough, fair enough. He's thinking from a, from a fiqhi point of view. Zakatul mal, the zakat you pay on an annual basis, is 2.5% of your savings. That's an obligation. We're talking about charitable act. Yani sabaka. Tamam, not, not zakat. So we've had, save the whole 1,000, I don't know for what. You're going to save it for what? Until you die, they bear, bear you with it. We have, a, uh, what was the other opinion? Give it, give the whole thing in sabaka, 2.5%. Anyone else? You, you have another opinion? You want to refute yourself? Go. Actually give half of it. Ah, now we're talking. So now, okay. So moderation means you have to give half? Who knows? Does Islam oblige you to give half? So how do you strike the balance in this matter? I think you should like fulfill your basic needs and then the rest you have to give. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. You fulfill your needs and then you can give the rest away in sabaka. Now here's the thing. Allah already tells us in the Quran. وَلَا تَغْلُوا الْيَدَكَ إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ don't, don't keep your hands tied to your weapon. So that you don't spend anything. وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا and then don't go stretch it out completely, then you will sit down insolvent and blameworthy. So this ayah, among other ayat, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ وَلَا تُبَذِّرْ تَبْذِيرًا is a foundational concept about how to deal with wealth. 
Islam does not teach you to withhold from yourself what Allah made lawful for you. In fact, you know Qarun? Who knows Qarun? Who can tell me the story of Qarun in, in like 20 seconds? I need new hands. The sisters are all on vacation. When I say the sisters, you don't have to look back. Trust me, there are sisters over there. I'm not talking about some images. They're all on vacation. Except the couple who answered. Who can tell me who Qarun is? I want new hands. You spoke earlier? Yalla, go ya, Sheikh. So Qarun was, uh, I think, at the time of Prophet Musa. Uh, Qarun is the time of Prophet Musa. Okay, I'm going to relay to the people, okay? And then uh, the keys of his treasure, treasure was so big that it had to be, like, like strong men carried it. So he was a miskeen? No. no. <laughs> yes. He was like very rich. He was so, like filthy rich, as they say. Like Bill Gates rich or more maybe? More. Uh, more. Dude had, man, his, the keys for his treasure needed some real tough dudes to carry it. The keys. Not the treasure itself. The, tre the treasure itself is a whole other discussion. All right, what was his problem? Uh, he was arrogant. Huh? So what, what was the advice that the people gave him? A lot of people miss out on this advice because that advice is key to our life. Yes, sir. Ah, and what did he say? He said, uh, I, I, I earned this with my own skills. You know, get off me. You don't know who I am. You don't know me. This is all me. And that's, that's the mentality of ignorant people. They don't recognize the involvement of Allah in what they have. The believer, on the other hand, realizes hey, nothing. Whatever special traits you have and qualities and talents and what have you, even though you might have acquired some of them through, through training, who allowed you to even learn through training? You know what I mean? Like there are things that Allah gave you when you were born. You're just talented like this. And there are things which you acquired, correct? Who allowed you to acquire them? Have you met people that no matter how much they learn, they don't learn? You know some people have been trying to drive for years and they still don't know how to drive? And some people, mashallah, in two days, uh, he's a Formula One driver. So what's the, the difference between them? You can compare yourself to your friend. Any game you start playing, quote unquote, maybe you learn it in two days and your friend, you know, one year later, he still doesn't know the controls. So you've acquired something. Who gave you the ability to learn? Did you go to some place and you paid money for it? It's a gift from Allah. Even that is a gift from Allah. So at the end, the believer recognizes that this is from Allah. The believer knows that whatever blessing you have, it's from Allah. Qarun felt that he was some superior man, you know, some gangster rapper, don't touch me type of mentality. I did this on my own. Now the people gave him some advice. The advice they gave him is the one that we need to be aware of, which is, Look man, with whatever Allah gave you, you should seek the life to come. Whatever Allah gave you, you should seek the life to come. What does that insinuate? It actually insinuates that you should use all your money ish in charity. No, no, no side conversations, please. You should use all your money in charity. Does anyone know the continuation of the ayah? Thank you, sir. But don't forget your share of the world. Meaning, meaning the moderation that we're asking for. Now, this principle applies to everything you want to play sports who wants who likes to play sports whatever type of sports they they are all right everybody now let me ask you a crazy question who likes to pray oh how cute i hope and pray that you're honest right because a lot of us the prayer is like oh man yeah sheikh but, but not but the get but there's always all these, you know, excuses. But if you ask about anything that we like, all hands go up. You ask about prayer. Who likes to fast in Ramadan? Okay, are you trying to impress me? Look, look, come on. Come on. If you do, wallahi, this is a blessing from Allah. If you truly, sincerely feel this way, I envy you. 
Alhamdulillah, in a good way. You should praise Allah that you have it. If you don't, don't trip. Chocolate chip, as they say. Don't get upset. It's okay. It means we have issues that we can resolve. If, if the act of worship is a burden, it means you have issues. But those issues are resolved. You can resolve them. They're not a dead end. They're not a, the end of the world. But in reality, moderation is just to enjoy yourself. And there's no harm in doing that. Don't let that reach a point where Allah's rights are being compromised. And the classic example that I can share with you is staying up at night to do whatever the heck you're doing versus Salatul Fajr. The average Muslim, whatever it is that he does at night is for the most part more important than Salatul Fajr so they don't wake up for Salatul Fajr to begin with. Khalas? They pray maybe Fajr once a month, maybe once a year, maybe only in Ramadan. And some of them only on Laylatul Qadr. He wants to make it special, you know, hit the jackpot. So you gamble all year, and all year you lose, you lose, and then on Laylatul Qadr, let me put all my money on this. It doesn't work this way with Allah. You, want, you usually will not be given the success to do anything substantial and significant on, your, on the Laylatul Qadr if you've been tripping the whole year. Just like the people who are, you know, crazy all year and then they want to go on Hajj. And you know, Hajj is a, hajj is a real test. Hajj, you know, لا جدال في الحج لا فسوق في الحج You can't argue, you can't even argue with people on Hajj. But that person's whole life is arguing. And we've seen it a million times. As from the moment he embarks on the journey, the first person he fights with is the bus driver. Within five seconds of Hajj, it's, it's already ruined. Is that with him? He lights up the cigarette. Ya Shaykh, Allah, this is Ya Baba. Hello. Ayya Hajj. Khalas, Ya Baba. Ru'a al-Bayt. Yes. No, it says لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. There is also another one. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Yeah, the, you you the, the, now it's the right ayah, but the, you change the first word. Okay. It's do I plug in and continue or what's the what's the relevance? It's that, that uh, what you said about uh, the charity and uh, that we give all our money to charity and that we use what we need. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Valid point. Let me finish the point, then I'll, I'll, I'll entertain your uh, question or, or interference. What was I saying? Who remembers what I was saying? Now we're going to get a test of concentration. Huh? Who remembers what I was saying? Bus drivers and smoking. That's all you remember, Ya Zareer? So you find that this person, their hajj is already ruined from the first moment, even though they thought they were going to nail it. They thought they were going to ace this hajj this year. The truth is it takes a lot of preparation for you to be able to conduct yourself in that way on hajj because it's the factor that they're forgetting is the tawfiq from Allah. Allah giving you success to do these things. So now the question that you should ask yourself and you should answer also is what is it that is preoccupying you to the point that you don't wake up for fajr? Whatever it is, I am sorry to tell you, you are not striking the balance. That thing is becoming more important than the basic right of salah. Five daily prayers is the, is the door from which you enter Islam. If you can't even maintain those, you're basically standing with one leg outside of Islam and one leg inside. Depending on how often you miss salah and you make salah, you're basically exiting and entering Islam. Exiting and entering Islam. So let's say Yawm al Qiyamah is like an earthquake. If you wanted to protect yourself from an earthquake, where do you usually stay? Let's say you know there's going to be an earthquake, la qaddar Allah. Where do you go? Mountains? Mountains? Habibi! Have a whole mountain fall on your head. Ground level? Ground level. Specifically, within this room, where do you go? Under the, under the table. You go under the table. I mean, it's a glass table, that's a problem. But minus that, you're supposed to go under the table. You don't stand at the door or a place where a cabinet can fall on your head or the chandelier or what, ha what have you. The safety is that you are in a place where you're protected. Praying five times a day will give you a table, a nice wooden thick table like this thick from an earthquake. 
praying sometimes or missing Fajr, you have one leg, you're standing at the door. As soon as the earthquake comes, the door is going to shut on you and you're going to be chopped in half. Or you never know, you might make it out, you might, you might die. We cannot. Nowadays, this, is, this conversation we're having right now should not exist. At no point in time should a Muslim tell you, oh, you have to pray five times a day. This is the bare minimum for you to remain afloat, for you to be, you're swimming. Some of us were swimming together, alhamdulillah, in Maldives. For you to be above water and breathing comfortably without drowning, you're praying five times a day, including Salatul Fajr on time. The Salatul Fajr at eight o'clock is not Salatul Fajr. It's actually Salatul Munafiq. It's the prayer of the hypocrite who is too lazy to get up for salah. Now that same person will tell you stories. Bro, I'm a heavy sleeper, man. I, I try, wallah, I put one alarm, two alarms, three alarms, blah, 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 story. He tells you 800 stories. Tell him, all right, I'm going to believe you. But let's just assume that you had a flight to catch and you were going to meet some famous person that you've been looking forward to meet all your life. Are you going to convince me that you will not wake up to catch that flight? You're going to convince me you will also miss the flight? Come on. Maybe one out of ten are that lazy. Nine out of ten, the shaitan has been fooling you successfully. The shaitan has played with your mind good enough for you to believe, oh, I have problems ah, because I'm this, I'm that. You're, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a matter of commitment. So, you want to enjoy yourself, you want to play sports, you want to do anything that is halal, needless to say, needless to say, anything is halal, please, please, Islam encourages you. وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا You know the hadith of Hanzala? Does anyone know the hadith of Hanzala? Hanzala. And uh, when they write in English, they write it with the Z, so it becomes Hanzala. Maybe you've read it in English once in your life? Nada? Any sister knows Hanzala? You know Hanzala? What happened to him? I'm going to relate. He went to the Prophet ﷺ. It's better. Yes. So the Prophet said, uh, you are uh, paraphrasing. Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me tell you the story. Hanzala, he went to the Prophet ﷺ to speak to him. He was unavailable. Who did he find instead? Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr told him, what brings you here? He said, I came to speak to the Messenger of Allah. He said, about what? He told him, when we're sitting with the Messenger of Allah, he reminds us of Jannah and Jahannam and all the good things. And our Iman is so high, it's as though we can, we can feel them and see them. But then when we leave the company of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, and we go back to our homes, we have wife, kids, you know, you're mixing and, and, and doing things at home, you're busy, you're preoccupied with the dunya, then we forget. So he said, Nafaka Hanzala. Hanzala became a hypocrite. I'm not a true believer, because when I'm with the Messenger of Allah, I'm two thumbs up. When I'm by myself, I'm one thumb down. I'm a hypocrite. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. You know who Abu Bakr is? You don't know Abu Bakr also? I will pack and leave. Who can give me one description of Abu Bakr in terms of his Iman? What did Prophet Sallallahu say about the Iman of Abu Bakr? He was the Prophet's number one fr best friend and uh, follower, yeah, but what was said about his Iman? His Iman is equivalent to the Iman of the Ummah. The whole Ummah will be put on one scale and the Iman of Abu Bakr on the other scale and we, they will balance each other out. You know what Abu Bakr told Hanzala? Yeah. He said, me too. Oh, you have this problem? I have this problem too. Let us both go to the Messenger of Allah and tell him our problem. Subhanallah. So they both went to the Messenger of Allah and they told him what they told him. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, By him in whose hand is my soul. If your state of mind remains the same as it is in my presence, and you are always occupied with the remembrance of Allah, the angels will shake your hands in your beds and on the streets. O oh, Handala, time should be devoted to this time and should be devoted to that. Sa'atun wa sa'a. A time for this and a time for that. You know what that means? That means that no one is telling you for you to be a good Muslim. You pray Fajr in the Jama'ah and then you read Quran until Dhuhr. Then you pray Dhuhr in the Jama'ah while fasting. And then you, you know, you study Islam until Asr. And then from Asr to Maghrib, you go to the graveyard and you help burying people. And No, 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 no. At the time of the Sahaba, the Prophet was telling him what? Sa'a wa sa'a. An hour for this and an hour for that. So my brothers and sisters, no, we're not telling you to overburden yourself with worship. At the same time, you have to give Allah his due right. Why? Because Allah needs it? No. Allah Azza wa Jal is in no need of any one of us here. What can you do to Allah anyways? In the Hadith Qudsi, Allah says, if all of us, all mankind, were as had the same righteousness of the most righteous man, each heart of ours was as righteous as the most righteous man, it will not increase Allah's sovereignty in anything. And if you were all the most evil people, each one of us was as evil as the most evil man, it will not decrease Allah's sovereignty and dominion in anything. Allah Azza wa Jal is ghani wa antum al fuqara Allah is the all rich and we are the poor ones. So don't think that we're doing Allah a favor. Who are we doing a favor? You're doing a favor to yourself. And if you don't, if you can't wrap your head around this idea, then you all go to school, right? Why do you study in school? When you study in school, when you do good in your exam, do you think the professor is the one who's going to benefit? Or you? If, the, if everyone failed in class, if everyone failed in class and the professor, the teacher is doing his job, do you think they will fire him? I did my work. I have, you, know, you could take video. You could record me during the, the class. Who will miss out? The students. So why do you have a problem when it comes to the religion, but you accept that in school? And it's a logical thing. You study for your own degree. Not for the school, not for the university, not for your parents. It's actually you, even if you fail. Your parents are going to be heartbroken, but at the end of the day, you're going to be the bum. You will be the one who's maybe homeless or... No income, no job, no, you can't get married, you can't, you can't do nothing. Really, you'll be handicapped in the sense. So even your school and education is actually for you. Similarly, our acts of worship are for us, not for Allah. The destination is Allah, but the, benefic the benef uh, beneficial one, the one who's benefiting, I'm sorry, the beneficiary is we, the, we, the human beings. But people don't, don't recognize that, they don't realize that. Actually, Islam is so much into moderation and the middle path that even in your salah, what does Allah say? وَلَا تَجْهَرْ بِصَلَاتِكْ وَلَا تُخَافِتْ بِهَا Don't be too loud in your salah and don't be too low. وَابْتَغِ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ سَبِيلًا And take a path in between. So when it comes to even recit dua, you know the dua that you hear the imams make uh, in Ramadan when he starts screaming his lungs off or lungs out? That's actually against the sunnah. When you make dua, you're supposed to be like a humble beggar. And a, a humble beggar, have you gone to someone who was begging and started screaming at you? Ah, man, give me money, man! Like, man, get out of here, dude. <laughs> what is the matter with you? Or if he says, I'm so, what did he say? What? What? Let me hear what you say. You want money? How much? You, you know, there, there should be a conversation where I understand you. That's, that's what a beggar does. If he screams, you're going to reject it. If he's too, you know, is not audible enough, you're going to reject it as well. And similarly, we learn from the sunnah that when we make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, this is where you have to moderate yourself and, and calm down because you're, Allah can hear you. Irrespective, even if you whisper, even if it's in your heart. But what did the Prophet do and what did Allah instruct him? That you should take a path in between. So even in the dua which you make, Islam calls you to moderation. 
Jabir, when describing the Salah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, كنت أصلي مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فكانت صلاته قصدا وخطبته قصدا. I used to pray with the Messenger of Allah. His prayer was of moderate length and his khutbah, his speech was of moderate length. Nowadays you go to a khatib for, you know, 90 minutes. People are sleeping and snoring and a couple of people died during the khutbah and he's still talking. That's not, that's not from the sunnah. The khutbah is supposed to be actually concise and precise and short. And the salah, some imam, mashallah, tabarakallah, is excited. He prays the people behind him are, are, are old people can't stand anymore. If you're leading the people in salah, then you need to consider them. When you pray on your own, pray all night. Barakallah feek. Two rak'ahs of yours, keep it until the morning. But some extremists, they don't consider the people behind them. Some people have to go to their job. Some people might need to go to the bathroom. Some people have other business to attend to. It doesn't mean that every time you pray, you recite Surah Al, you know, Al Kawthar and Al Ikhlas. At the same time, when you read in people's salah, you're supposed to be moderate. And so that's again how Islam teaches moderation. Abdullah ibn Amr reported that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, Oh Abdullah, I am told that you fast all day and pray all night. I said, of course, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, do not do so. This is from the Messenger of Allah, do not do so. Fast and break your fast. Pray in the night and sleep. Verily, your body has a right over you, your eyes have a right over you, and your wife has a right over you. Again, this is another principle of Islam. So for people who are extreme in worship, the Prophet ﷺ instructed them to be moderate. You don't fast every day and you pray every night. Other people have rights over you. Nowadays, sadly, you know who's taken up that right? Fortnite. That, that your parents' rights are not, it's not because you were praying. Like, uh, what's his name? Who was in the Sawma'ah? Jurej. You know Jurej, story of Jurej. Jurej was, was used to pray so much at the time of Bani Israel. And his mother called him. While he was praying nafila, he's praying volunteer prayer. He said he would say in the salah, Oh Allah, my mom or my salah. And what did he choose? His salah. Until his mother made dua against him. I'm not going to elaborate because of your ages. His mother made dua against him and Allah tested him with this. And his life went down below the seventh ground. He was almost killed. And he was accused of the worst things you can think of. Until Allah Azza wa Jal saved him. And we learn from this hadith that if you're praying, if you're praying nafila, if you're praying to Allah, the sunnah, and your mother calls you, you know what you're supposed to do? Leave your salah. Did you guys know this? How many of you knew this? Raise your hand. Impressive. While you're praying. You can... While you're praying. Say, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. You go to mommy. Sunnah. Sunnah. If you're praying your farida. If you're praying the obligatory prayer, then you don't unless there's something wrong. You hear something wrong with your mom, she needs your, you can tell by the tone of voice, then you, you leave the salah. But if it's if just uh, she wants you to get the laundry or mop the floor or do something, I don't know what mothers ask of you nowadays, then you wait until your obligatory salah is done. But if it's a volunteer prayer, you leave it. Nowadays, you're behind your PS4 or your Xbox and your mom is calling you, hey, hey. Mom, I lost because of you. Yes, yeah, Sheikh. Yeah, Sheikh, that is suicide. Believe it, that is suicide in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Don't even say uff to your parents. And you know what uff means? It's any expression of, you're getting on my nerves. You're bothering me. Of course, it changes from a culture to a culture. Each one of us, depending on where you come from, you express this uff differently. It doesn't matter which one it is. If you express dissatisfaction, you have actually fallen into that category. And that is a very dangerous place to be. So I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to create awareness about where we are versus where the moderate balanced path is. Now we don't ignore our parents because we're, like you know, Prophet told them, don't pray all night. Your wife has a right over you. 
Don't fast all day, your wife has a right over you. Now we're not talking about the wife, your parents, who are even more important than your wife. And the more, most important things in your life are being sidelined over little issues. Over your phone, over this, over that, over your friends. Be careful. You want to be practical? When you go home, you know, I don't know how you express your love to your parents or appreciation. You kiss their hand, you kiss their head. You don't, you say thank you, I don't care how you, how you do it. But you need, to, you need to change your behavior with your parents. Allah will give you so much success in your life beyond what you even imagine if, you are, if your parents are pleased with you and you can expect the exact opposite if your parents are not pleased with you. And I have flash news for you. If you are above 15 years old or other things have happened to you, meaning you've reached puberty, you are in trouble, young man. And women because before that age you can get away with it you're still you know you're not held accountable you're you're starting off on the wrong foot but until you actually reach that age of discretion nothing is being written against you but if you reach that age and you're still like this danger you are in danger change it change it for a change try see what Allah Azza wa will facilitate for you in your life we're going to come to an end, inshallah ta'ala, uh, because I think I've gone over the time allocated and we want to entertain some questions. I'm going to conclude with a classic example of how to be balanced based on a dua that the Prophet wasallam taught us. I could almost guarantee you that maybe only five of you maximum know this dua, based on my experience. When it comes to the adhkar of the morning and the evening and the adu'ya, for whatever reason, Allah, most Muslims are like, what? That sounds nice. I've never heard of it before. Even though these ad'i are standard. They're standard. But that dua is so beautiful because it is an embodiment of striking the balance. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Allahumma aslih li deeni alladhi huwa Asmatum. Huh? How many have I heard? Alladhi huwa? Good. So all these people know it. Oh Allah, rectify, this is a dua. Oh Allah, rectify for me, fix for me the affair of my religion because it is that thing which keeps me in check. It is actually the most important stronghold, the thing that I adhere, that is the most important thing to adhere to. The first dua you make is what? Allah to fix what? Your religion. Not your money, not your body, not your skills, not your school, which is cool. But the first thing that you want to be fixed and set straight is your religion, your religious commitment, your adherence to Islam. That's the first thing. وَأَصْلِحْ لِي دُنْيَايَ أَلَّتِ فِيهَا مَعَاشِي And rectify for me my dunya. In which is what? My, li my livelihood. I mean, I live in this dunya. What does Allah say about the true believers? Who knows what you're supposed to say between الرُّكْنِ الْيَمَانِ and الحجر الْأَسْوَدِ when you're doing tawaf? Anyone else? Any one of the sisters? Between al ruqn al-Yamani and al hajar al-Aswad, the black stone. That corner before the black stone, there's a dua you're supposed to say when making tawaf, between those two. The boys know, the girls don't know? Alright, what is it? Thank you. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan. Oh Allah, give us in this dunya, good. Wa fil akhirati. Hasan, and give us good in the life to come. That's actually the balance. Notice, you don't just say, oh Allah, admit me to paradise and then khalas, make my dunya destroyed. No, you want Allah to fix your deen and you want Allah to fix your dunya. You want to have a nice car? No problem. Pay attention. You want to have a nice, comfortable car? No problem. You want to have a spacious house? No problem. The Prophet said from the, from the facilitation, from the enjoyment of the dunya is having a, a decent ride. Of course, back then it was an animal. Nowadays it's a vehicle and a spacious house and having a good wife and for the sister, a good husband. These are things that you should seek. There's no issue in them. As long as they don't become your main objective and then you forget about Salah and forget about Islam and you don't even practice religion because you're trying to get a good job so you can buy a new car. Now, now you're tripping. Now you've gone off the track. But if you're doing what Allah wants you to do and then while there you're getting other stuff, please knock yourself out. Enjoy it. وأصلح لي دنيا التي فيها معاشي وأصلح لي آخرتي التي إليها معادي and rectify for me my life to come because that's my appointment وجعل الحياة زيادة لي 
في كل خير make this life for me a means for me to increase in every type of good والموت راحة لي من كل شر and make death means of being safe from every type of evil this dua is so wonderful so beautiful so concise so precise so useful if you say it with a sincere heart you're asking Allah to fix your religion and to fix your dunya and to fix your akhirah is there anything left? خلاص that's Islam that's striking the balance when we Muslims do this believe me we will be the superior ones and we will become good examples for others without even uttering a word some of you were talking about Muslims mocking other religions and so on and so forth you will not even need to have a discussion with people of other faith the way you live your life in a balanced manner will attract people because they don't have this reality you see they can have a lot of the rituals but the Iman the matter of Iman is not is absent only a believer in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah truly has Iman everyone has elements of it but it's not whole wholesome it's not complete it's not full so we have an advantage and edge over others but we don't utilize it instead we compromise it and we give up on it and we go chasing after others and then we wonder why are Muslims like this why are Muslims like that it's because we're not convinced but we need to be convinced first you know the concept of selling a product can you sell something that you yourself are not convinced about you can't unless you're a big liar for you to be able to sell a product you have to be Convinced in it. For you to sell Islam, you have to be convinced in it. If you can't convey Islam to others, because you yourself don't believe in the, in the beauty of Islam. And wallahi, Islam is a beautiful thing. We should praise Allah day and night that He made us Muslims. And we should be, you know, working hard to bring people into Islam for their own good. Nobody's going to give you some money in your pocket. But you will see that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But we should first, the balance here is before you start with others, who will you start with? Before you go to others, start with yourself. So from now on, in summary, we will pray how many times a day? Five times a day, on time. Huh? If there's a masjid nearby for the brothers, you pray in jama'ah. Fajr, please. Salatul Fajr. It's a matter of training. I promise you. I promise you. You train yourself, you will reach a point not too long after where your body will wake up on its own. You don't even need an alarm anymore. People didn't have alarms back then. You will wake up on your own. Your body is whatever you train your body to be. You are in control. It's mind over matter. It's always mind over matter. You are the boss. You are the boss. You are in charge. But you need to make an effort. So praying jama'ah, praying fajr, I'm sorry, in hadir, on time. Then secondly, your parents. Stop messing with your parents. Stop driving them crazy. Stop being lazy. Do your school. The school, now in the world we live in, uneducated people, except with some minor exceptions, they suffer the most. Uneducated people don't get good jobs and therefore they're always trying to catch up. When you have a good job that will pay off your bills, it will give you time to focus on doing your worship, doing things that you need to do. You're not preoccupied with trying to earn a, you know, something to eat at the end of the day. And let's just say, let's say that's not the case. If your parents become happy, if you can make them happy by being educated, then do so for the sake of making them happy. Allah will be pleased with you. Fix your relationship with your parents. Do not make anything more important than them because there's nothing more important than them. And I know your parents are, some of them might be a little wild. Maybe they're old school, they're outdated. They don't even know what's going on in the world. It's all right. It's all right. Not everybody's parents are going to be hip and cool and, and up to date. Some parents are old. Some parents don't exist. SubhanAllah. Some of us have lost our parents. If you have them, it's a big blessing from Allah. If there's a, a gap between the two of you, it's okay. You have to be the one who understands. Don't be too philosophical with them. Thirdly, strike the balance in your life and try to deliver it to others. Be the influencer in school, in your group, don't be the one being influenced. Be the leader. Don't be the follower. Be the boss. Don't be the employee who's always told what to do. You run the show. You can run your own show. You can run your own life. Or you can decide to be an actor. That's what determines success. This is true success. Not that your bank account is fat. 
and you have a Bentley outside, a lot of these people commit suicide eventually, or they're not happy, or they might go to hell at the end of the day. True happiness is when the dunya is, at, it's, is in your hand, but in your heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the akhirah, preparation for the life to come. Ask Allah Azza wa to make us among those who can do that and implement it in our life. So, let's have some questions. Q&A, I ask questions and you answer. Hamad, Wallah, I miss you, Hamad. You know that you haven't left us since we left? My kids, they speak the same way you do now. Every time one of them speaks, I'm like, where's Hamad? Turns out to be Mu'ath. Leem Tidr. You know the Leem Tidr? Nobody knows Leem Tidr? Type any questions? MashaAllah, one by one, brothers. I cannot take all this at the same time. Still on vacation? Uh, yes, Mr. Gap. Mine is actually, uh, mine is actually a fact. So uh, actually, it's uh, really similar to what happened in the time of Prophet Saleh alayhi salam. The people said that uh, they had gotten the skills they had got it by themselves. The Prophet Saleh and his followers had survived it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent an earthquake to destroy the people who hadn't worshipped him. Sakallah khair. That's good. You got this from the Quran? Did you read it from the Quran or you read a story about like the stories of the Prophets? The stories of the Prophets. By Ibn Kathir? Or you don't know who the author is? Good enough. Huh? Good enough. Uh, a Prophet Salih, Alhamdulillah, he knows him. Some of us didn't know Ibn Mas'ud. Thank you, Akhi, for that uh, contribution. Zakallah khair. Anyone else? Any questions? Any question that comes to mind? Relate to the topic, not related to the topic? You want to ask me about smartphones? Then don't ask. Yes, sir. Very good, very good. But no, 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 no. Very good point. Now, let me, let me, let me break it down for you. Wallah, jazakallah khair. First of all, jazakallah khair. I'll tell you why. Number one, because... Anyone is what? Fallible. Meaning sometimes your teachers, your instructors, the leaders, the sheikh, each one of us has his own shortcomings. So sometimes we might forget. There's never any harm in reminding someone about the deen of Allah, but with wisdom. You don't go say, ah, sheikh, you're a clown, man. Tell me about salah, you don't even pray yourself. Hey, 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 calm down, man. That's a, you know, that's a teacher, you got a way to communicate. But there's no harm in letting the person know that they might have been doing something wrong. Number one, zakallah khair. Number two, for us to have to pray in jama'ah, what is it that has to happen? You have to hear the adhan from the masjid without the loudspeakers. Without the loudspeakers. Did, did, did you hear it? I didn't. So if we didn't hear the adhan from the masjid without loudspeaker, then we don't have to attend the congregation. Number three, it's actually a sunnah to, to delay isha, unless you're going to pray in jama'ah. Meaning, let's say you went out. You went out uh, to the desert or some outing. If you had to choose between praying Isha early and praying Isha late, as long as there's no, you are the Jama'ah, you guys make the Jama'ah, it is better to delay it than praying it early because that's what Prophet ﷺ said once. He came to the masjid, all the Sahaba were sleeping. He said, this is the right time. This is the right time. Had it not, if I did not want to make it difficult on the Ummah, that is the right time of Salat al-Isha. Fourthly, because we are, mashallah, bigger Jama'ah than the masjid, We've already discussed that after we finish the lecture, we will pray. Because imagine, uh, Islam is also, there's logic. If in the middle of the lecture, we say, okay, everybody get up and pray, and then we continue, uh, it would be an issue. Unless it's Maghrib, and we're going to miss it. But alhamdulillah, we have until midnight, till Isha, so no issue. Zakallah for bringing up good stuff, man. I like it. Yes, sir. So my friend is asking if having a girlfriend is wrong. Oh, what a cute question. Oh. You reminded me of a question I got, I think it was in India. It might have been in India or Sri Lanka, I'm trying to remember. Uh, the guy said, he said, uh, look, I know that having a girlfriend is haram, but also breaking the heart of another Muslim. 
And so the reason why I'm still, you know, going out with her because I don't want to break her heart. I said, ah, oh, how cute. <laughs> MashaAllah alayk. La, straight to Jannah with this mentality. Yeah. As long as you're thinking about others on your own expense, then you're good to go. I mean, you answer the question yourself. Let's define. Let's, let's have definition. What's, who's the youngest one here? These kids shouldn't be hearing this, man. But anyways, we're living in a world where everything is out there. What is the definition of a girlfriend? It's obviously not a friend who's a girl. All right? Because that's another discussion. Let's assume that's a classmate or something. That's another discussion. A girlfriend has... They, they are boxes that have to be ticked. And you will not find a single halal box. Box, I'm sorry, to tick. If you had to have like 10 boxes, and you have to want halal one, then you can say it's okay. Not even one. Huh? You have one? No, well, what if uh, you're going to marry her in the future? Oh, then, uh, very good. But then, 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 let me tell you, then let me tell you what it is. Chief, chief, chief. That's a good, oh, that's, we're getting smarter. You, you pray in the mass together? No, wait, next to each other or she's behind you? She's behind you? You think, huh, mashallah? <laughs> type, type. Time out, ya imam. Ya imam of the females who's praying behind him. Listen, time out. Number one, ya habibi, if you want to marry a sister, zakallah khair, then she is a stranger, and then she is your wife. She goes from being stranger to being your wife. There's nothing in between, except if there's an engagement, and your parents know, and her parents know, and that when you meet, you meet in one of those homes where your parents are around, knock yourself out. But usually, you cannot be having a private conversation. There are people around there. So in Islam, because look, just to make it very simple for you, you, you have to think differently. Meaning you're thinking about yourself now, but would you want that for your sister? Or would you want that for your daughter if you were a father? Would you want some funny guy to come and, you know, play with your uh, daughter, play her as they say, uh, only to tell her later, you know what? I'm not really sure about this, for example. Of course, you will say, no, I don't want that. Similarly, then you shouldn't do this to the sisters of, of other people. But on a very basic level, if you are interested in marriage, we have, pay attention, we have a channel. There is a channel in Islam. And by the way, Islam is very moderate, meaning there are some cultures, and I've, I've met brothers who said he only saw his wife when? When did he see his wife for the first time? After they got married. That's insane. That is, that is ludicrous. Meaning you were up for a surprise the whole time. And then on, you know, once she's your wife, it's like, what? What? Wait. And then you just die from a stroke. That's not fair. This happened at the time of Prophet The Prophet said, did you see her? Did you see her? Go see her. You have to see this. So in Islam, we're not telling you that she's going to be a complete no one, anonymous person, and then suddenly, boom, there she is, she's your wife. At the same time, you cannot be, you know, you know, <laughs> being friends and uh, going out and going to the movies and dating and all this, you know, all these gimmicks, and then, and then you don't know whether it will work out or not. At the end of the day, no one has any guarantee that that marriage will materialize. Therefore, what have you been doing in the meantime? Gaining sin. So realistically speaking, I know there's a lot of peer pressure and the, the society in which we live, it's very normal, but that's what makes you a Muslim. That's what makes you a leader. That's why I was saying you have to be a leader. You teach people these discipline and then you try to adhere. Of course, we are all fallible, we make mistakes, but we cannot change the rules. We can say, I failed in implementing the rule, but you cannot change the rule. And the rule, each one of you knows in his natural disposition, even if I didn't answer you, Allah already gave you a heart that will tell you, mm, stop playing games. Yes. So the, are we going to continue the girlfriend discussion? Uh huh. Huh? My toe, man, is still busted, man. Where's the guy? It's okay, I forgive him. I'm, I'm getting there, alhamdulillah. I have problems. You know, I was almost recovered 100%. I went to the park with my kids. I saw some kids playing soccer. And I sat there for like 10 minutes, like, nah. Just grow up, man. You're an old man already. Don't do it. Don't do it. Then I was like, hey, guys, can I join? And then, no, no, not only that. I said to myself, I only play with the right foot, right? I'll leave the left foot. The guy, some kid was going for a shot. I decided to block a shot with my left foot. <laughs> and I felt my toe jump out of my shoe and go back in. But anyways, that will delay my recovery, but it's okay. Yes, sir. Um, if 
in the masjid, there are people that are doing like things wrong, like in jama'at, for example, they're, they're reciting out loud or, or you know, looking around or, you know, some, some of these things that you're not supposed to do. And after you tell them, they become mad, like, oh, why are you focusing on my prayer? You know, what, what are you doing? Why are you telling me? And they're stubborn. And then they do it again, whatever. Okay. You're supposed to do this kind of people. But the question, the question is, how are you seeing all this in your salah? No, no, no. no. It's, not, it's not my example. It's somebody else. Like some, well, somebody, some person I know told them, why are you reciting loudly? In, in okay, the okay. That, they, didn't, they didn't accept their, their mistake. It's normal. The, the average human being, illa man rahim Allah, is prideful. They don't like to be corrected. And so it takes some guts for someone to be humble and say, Zakallah khair, I, you know, you're right. Most people become defensive. Your job is to advise wisely. Yani don't be aggressive. Try to deliver it in the nicest way possible. Even though you might get a rejection, it's okay. You're, you've done your job of uh, enjoying what is good and forbidding what is evil. So the idea is that you want to be gentle about it. All right, but at the same time, don't, don't become deterred or stop doing it because you know that not most likely they're going to, you know, become defensive and rejected. No, it's, you still tell the person, Akhi, you know, this is not appropriate. You're standing before Allah Azza wa Jal. What do you mean? You look at a lot of people, look around. A lot of people have eye contact with you. It happens to me all the time, but when we're done with the salah, you know, you finish salah and there are the people that came late, they're behind you. As you're leaving, the brother's looking you in the eye. It's like, what's up, man? Are you praying or what? Like he's, he's almost going to look back at you. Like what's your issue? Nonsense. Yes? Being an actor. Huh? Oh. Being an actor? Yeah. That you think you have some acting skills, Yani? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a difference of opinion. There, there's a difference of opinion because acting entails that you're lying the whole time. The whole time acting is just a bunch of lying. So it's, it's a very thin line. I'm not a mufti to tell you. I know there are opinions that allow it and there are opinions that don't allow it. So, that's, I will leave it at that. Yes? What's the previous discussion? Yeah, Sheikh. And that looks like you have a girlfriend, you can't get rid of her. Oh. oh. Tayyip, go ahead. So, what if I make the intention that I would play her and she plays me? So <laughs> Shukran, very good point. Jazakallah khair, you're such a kind soul. But she could play you. The bottom line is that we don't want to play. We don't know who's going to play a Habibi. You might play her, she might play you, you might play each other. Stop playing. That's just stop playing and then get married. Look, if a person is serious, they will go for marriage. That's just the bottom line. If they're serious, they will go for marriage. If they don't want to go for marriage, something's wrong. Uh, in Islam, are you allowed to have a friend with a girl? No. It's an acquaintance. Someone that you might see often, someone that is in your world. Yes, but uh, you know, you mean you, you talk all the time, you're friends, but she's not your girlfriend, then uh, that's an open door. The reality is, even though a lot of people are oblivious, most men are programmed not to be able to have friends that are girls for long. It won't be long before the shaitan be like, yo. And then you'll be like, oh. <laughs> So in that moment, he, the shaitan might not introduce it from day one because he, you know, you're so cool and you're so modern. You know, I'm just, I'm, she's just a friend, man. Come on, man. Not every, I don't look at it that way. Not for long. Yeah, so just wake up. Yes? And that you were sleeping earlier, yeah, Captain? You know, it's Asha time, yeah, Shaykh. Wallah, we will pray. Inshallah, we will pray. Yes? And that you're his secretary, or what's the story? If, if he wanted you, لا, معلش, if he wanted you to ask me, you should have done so without saying Hamad. <laughs> خلاص, يعني, now whatever you ask me, no, it's Hamad. You burnt him out. هاتي Hamad, هات. تكلم بالعربي ما حد يفهم علينا. ما عندك شيء? So my my friend is asking you because he's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Captain. Sorry, he, he's asking if it's fine. For him to marry a girl who's 11 years younger. <laughs> Wait, if, if you're 13, she, she's one? He's Two? He's 15, she's four? Yeah, but so I have, uh, what is this, like one of those uh, prepared, what do they call them? <laughs> you have four wives? Inshallah, may Allah bless you. All right, change the subject of this because I think we've, we've taken this to another level. Khalas, enough about, huh? 
<laughs> no one said the food is not halal. Knock yourself out. But I mean, do you have to tell everybody here now? We're not going to have a wedding. Inshallah, invite me as well. Any other questions? The sisters have not asked anything. Yes. Of course it's overwhelming. So in order to avoid the confusion, let's just take Islam out of the equation, right? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. Uh, very good. That's a good question. How do you balance it is by... Right. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, look, it's... It, that very... Guys, guys, no side conversations, please. That depends on the person and their circumstance. So let's say you have school. Uh, school is demanding. Some people are, mashallah, bright. They, they barely study. They just pick up everything fast. They're, they're naturally alert. So they need less studying time. And some people require a lot of studying. Whatever the case may be, when Salah time comes, you go going to pray. And so no matter how much or long it takes you to study, all we're telling you is that pray on time. Uh, for you don't have to do much during the day. Minus the five daily prayers and, you know, if you can do dhikr, zakum la khair. But fundamentally as an obligation, you just have to pray five times a day and avoid the haram. There's no issue in that. That, that is not exhausting. It is not demanding. It's easy. It, even if you spend all the time in between, between obeying your parents and making them happy and studying for school, no problem. There are rarely cases where you're so busy that you don't have time to pray. How long is prayer? Five, ten minutes? What, you don't go to the bathroom? You say, oh, of course I have to go to the bathroom. And you have to pray. If you think the bathroom is so important for your survival, Salah is even more important for your survival. No one just sorry, they just urinate on themselves and defecate on themselves because they had to study. You get up and go to the bathroom, excuse you, get up and pray. Come on, I mean you can bet, you see what I'm saying? It's not that hard. Don't let the shaitan make it feel, make you think that it's such a uh, you know, steep mountain to climb. It's a piece of cake. But practice makes perfect. Yes, you're going to struggle in the beginning until it becomes habitual, you adapt to it, then khalas, everything will fall in place, inshallah. What? What happened? Are you talking trash about me? <laughs> Any other questions that are not related to girlfriends? No. <laughs> 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 Hati Hamad, yalla ya Sheikh, warana shughul. Do I miss Maldives? I miss you guys more than the Maldives, to be honest with you. Aww. Aww. See, that's acting right there. <laughs> no, no. no, I'm serious. Well, I, I, I honestly miss the combination uh, of... Uh, Maldives is nothing if it wasn't for the brotherhood. I think what really made it beautiful is what, we, what Allah blessed us to do together. If I go on my own, maybe it will not be as, as much fun. But yeah, it was good times, man. Oh, stop. No, 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 no. Okay, that's too cheesy. It's not a concert. Anyone else? Hamad, I thought you had a serious question. Allah Hadiq. Yes? Yeah, yeah, listen, listen. Very good question. Very good question. Vaping is one of these major harams. Pay attention. Look, look, look. Let me tell you something. Any sin in Islam, any sin in Islam has levels of gravity. All right? Any sin, it could be major sin, it could be minor sin. How do we differentiate between them depending on what's involved? Let me give you some examples of smoking. I'm not just going to focus on vaping, just smoking. What are the type of violations involved with smoking? Here, here they are. Number one, dinero. Money. Money that you could be spending on halal or you could be spending on, on a biskeen, you are burning it. Number two, your body. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you this body as a trust. He entrusted us with this body and you are violating it in the worst ways possible. And excuse me, in my crazy days, I was the biggest smoker on earth. So I'm telling you from experience, Smoking will, will make you among those who after you run for, run for 15 seconds, you are out of breath on the verge of death. Now you're young, or a lot of the young people, they think they got it under control. Wait, Habibi. Wait until your lungs become black, 
then you will understand that it's no joke. So you're destroying your lungs. Number three, you are uh, harming yourself and you're harming others. And harming others is the worst thing you could do in this life. Because any sin between us and Allah is resolvable. But the sins that can that affect others, those people will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as, as the Prophet ﷺ said, they will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and say, Yo, give me the fresh air Allah created and you took away. Allah gave us fresh air. When you smoke, whatever you smoke and you're forcing everyone in your environment, including plants and ants and insects and humans, to smoke along with you. They all have the right on Yawm Al-Qiyamah to say, give me the fresh air Allah gave me and you took away from me. How are you going to pay them back? You know what's the currency? Your good deeds. Your good deeds. And I can go on. I can go on. It stinks. You're going to tell me vape now, you know, it's not as bad as cigarettes. At the end of the day, it stinks. And so you're like, just compared to armpits. You're walking around smelling nasty. So you're harming the people. You're harming the believers. You're harming the angels in the masjid. When you take that stuff to the masjid, sometimes when I enter the masjid, I immediately know the person next to me whether he's a smoker or not. Because now my whole salah is me trying to avoid smelling him. Whether he ate garlic, onions, or smoked a cigarette or a vape. It's all the same. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give us a foul stench, a stench. So the bottom line is, on all these levels, you're harming yourself. And Allah will ask you about all those on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So after all this, how can someone even think that smoking is not a haram or it's makruh? They're out of their minds. They thought so before they made any studies about what smoking does. When it was only a smell, they thought, okay, it's like onions and garlic, it's makruh. Then afterwards, all the scholars who don't smoke, they tell you it's haram. The only scholar who says it's halal is the smoker himself. Now, he cannot tell you, Allah, it's haram. <laughs> haram to smoke, ya shaykh. Amanta, you are a smoker yourself. So he tells you it's halal. Otherwise, he knows. I hope you quit. Not you, whoever's smoking. Yes? Uh, what's the opinion on second jamaat? Because although it's done commonly now, in the Prophet's time, there was no second jamaat. There was. At the time of the Prophet, when a man entered for Salatul Fajr and he was late, the Prophet ﷺ said, can one of you give him sadaqah and join him in the salah? That was the second jamaat. Uh, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars. Some of them say you enter the masjid and everybody prays on their own. And some of them say you catch that other jama'ah. Obviously the reward, the ultimate reward is associated with the first jama'ah. But it doesn't mean that you don't pray with the, another jama'ah that exists. Good question. Fiqhi question. Yeah. So, uh, since having a girlfriend is... Uh, <laughs> no, it is not that person. Since it's haram, is it okay to cause self-pleasure? <laughs> well, well, we'll discuss that later, inshallah. Tayyib, uh, the sisters, any questions from the sisters? Yes? Is it true that anything that harms your body is haram? Anything that harms your body is haram, yes. Uh, so you're going to tell me what about sugar and this and that? Is that what you, yeah, again, again, anything which you do excessively, if let's say somebody's diabetic, and if they continue to eat sugar, they will harm their body, and the doctor tells them that it's haram for them to have sugar. See that, that cheesecake? It's haram for them to eat that cheesecake. No. So the things, that, having a cheesecake will not kill anyone unless they, they have a, if they're doing it excessively. Unlike smoking. Smoking, no matter what the quantity, is going to harm you. Whereas a cheesecake, it depends on your health and, and physical condition. So yes, it could become haram for certain people who have certain pre-existing conditions, but it's not haram for everybody else because it's halal in and of itself. But the usage is becoming haram. Clear? Yes? Go ahead. Uh, this is going back on the diabetes thing. If this person has diabetes and is eating sugar in high amounts, but is also taking insulin for it, well, is that haram? Does Maybe, it become haram? Do the doctors say have a lot of sugar then take insulin? No. I don't think so. Yeah, that, that, that's suicide. That's a form of suicide. You're, and Allah says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't kill yourselves. And killing yourself can be by, you know, busting a cap in your own head. Or it could be by hanging yourself. Or it could be by smoking, because it's a gradual type of killing. Or it could be by taking, let's say, let's say you bought a bottle of poison. And I'm not giving you any ideas. I know you're smarter than that. But if you took a bottle of poison, if you drank the whole bottle of poison, you will die. Or if you took 20 milliliters every day for one week, you will die. 
Can anyone say that it's okay to take it for six days and stop on the seventh? خلاص ما. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is that you're going to die. It's a form of suicide. So eating sugar, knowing that, you know, what if you don't get to the insulin? What if it runs out? What if you, you, know, you miss it? You can't take it? You still committed suicide. So if the doctor says no sugar, خلاص, no sugar. You can leave that knafa. Someone else will eat it. I want knafa now. Yes. Only two sisters are active, the rest are watching, that's good. Huh? Yes? Guys, Malish, excuse me. Brothers, one this, يعني, out of respect for others, whether a male or a female. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, is studying psychology allowed in Islam? Of course, studying psychology is allowed, but. That's fine, as long as you don't reach a point where you tell someone, look, you have anxiety, Beethoven is going to save your life. Some of you don't even know who Beethoven is. Uh, you can study whatever you want to study, but what you exercise in your daily life has to be within the Islamic guidelines. That's all. You can study whatever, but if you're going to reach a point where you ignore Islamic teachings and advise people to disobey Allah so they can fix their problems, then, then this knowledge of yours will backfire. It will become an evidence against you. But if you, like Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he used to know all types of sciences of deviant people, because he would use that for, to prove to the people the validity of the Quran and the Sunnah and so on and so forth. No problem. But you have to be very careful about what you exercise after you have attained this knowledge from university. I hope it's clear. Khalas? It's a wrap. Alright, so whoever needs to make wudu, uh, then there's one bathroom. Oh. oh. We're going to have to learn Discipline, not tayammum, why tayammum You can make it with, with tea. Um, we have to learn discipline and you know, how to work this without causing uh, havoc in this place. It's a nice place. We want to be as civilized as possible. Sometimes the Muslims are the least civilized people and the non-Muslims turn out to be a lot more civilized. I hope we can make a change. So, you know, civilized, you don't throw your shoes everywhere and you know, you, you stand in an orderly, you respect each other, people go in line. Get the job done so we can pray Salatul Isha. So, Zakabullah Khair, uh, I hope uh, you've benefited from this. Forgive any mistakes and shortcomings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanaka Allah wa bihamdik. Shadu la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka atubu lak. I don't think this mic is even working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>